Hello everybody, I'm Nick and this video I want to thank you for 50,000 subscribers. Thank you very much. After two and a half years of making videos, I can actually believe we reached this milestone. And as part of this celebration, I want to make a Q&A video answering your own technical, professional and personal questions. Now I know not everybody's cup of tea is that type of video and you're here for technical videos. So if you don't like that idea, please skip this video and I'll see you on the next one. However, I will have chapters and timestamps if you want to skip to a question that sounds interesting to you, so you don't have to watch the whole video if you don't want to. There are quite a few questions here, so I'm just gonna dive straight into that. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and ring the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So let's see the first question from Cabbage McGraw. Congratulations. The question is, what is my preferred way of learning? Docs, online courses, books. So this heavily depends. But nowadays, my way of learning is actually doing the thing. If I want to try new tech, I'm going to download it, run it in Docker and try it out. If I want to learn a new language, I'm going to download an ID, um, download a sample project and then try to learn by patterns. And then as problems arise, I'm going to Google the stuff I want to and I'm going to get to the conclusions. So it's not that I'm going to read a full constructed doc or watch a full course or read a book. It's rather getting my hands dirty. That being said, if I want to learn about how to do something properly at scale, then I might watch a course specific to that uh, part, how to do, no, 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 elastic search scale, for example. But nine times out of 10, I will just do the thing. This has changed throughout the years and I can't quite remember how I learned stuff in the beginning. I think it was just that I was working with mentors that would point me at the right direction and they would give me advice and then I would just go ahead and do research on my own, that sort of thing. Smola asks, how do I find topics for my videos? I usually think that everything I know is wide known by everyone and not worth covering in a video. So this is interesting because it has changed in two years. Um, nowadays, my process is I'm trying to find the story behind the tech. So, for example, the uh, task dot when all video. If I just show you the feature, that's like one minute video. There's no interesting thing in it. It's just a task aggregation um, thing and we just move forward. Or like the, um, the string dot empty and the double quotes empty string. Those are very simple concepts, but it's the story around it teaching you how to investigate it on your own or helping you understand how it can be used to make your racing calls faster. Finding those stories behind the videos is what actually helps me sell them better to you and get you to click and get you to watch and get you to learn ultimately, which is my goal and always was. Now, Gary Barrett asks, what is the most important advice career tip? Um, what do I believe is the most important activity people should do to advance their careers? So first and foremost, I'm going to give some advice to graduates and junior developers. Um, and it's just one tip of advice, which is your ego will help you way more than your amateur coding skills. And always remember that. Nobody comes out of uni or gets to the first job and they're hot shit, but they do think they are some of the time. So tone that down, be humble. There's smarter people around you. Try to learn from them. Don't try to outsmart them. And then when it comes to any other person, blogs and open source and whatever, that those are fine, but you're going to learn the tech itself. You need to be enthusiastic though. And that's the problem. I can hire someone who hasn't coded before and teach them how to code and make a great coder out of them. But being a software engineer in a company, for example, is more than just the code. It is the character. It is, are you fun to work with? Are you a jerk? Are you, it's the whole thing. Are you enthusiastic? So that can take you a long way, getting people to like you or want to work with you. As a side note, and I know that some of you might not actually like this idea, uh, but if you actually see that there is something that the company needs and you don't have enough time to do it in the sprint or during working hours and you go out and do it and you present it afterwards, this can take you a long way. And I've personally done this multiple times and I think it's one of the most important reasons why I advanced my career fairly quickly. So. Not everyone likes this idea, but the truth is, it will take you a long way. Now, I have three questions that are kind of linked together. The first one is, how long have I been programming? What languages I know and which one I learned first? And did I study in uni or am I self-taught? So, I started programming uh, when I was 15, uh, self-taught originally. Then I went uni 
uh, because I liked it so much and I thought uni would teach me more. Little did I know it didn't, but anyway, I got great friends out of it, so it doesn't really matter. And then how many programming languages I know, I know C Sharp, and that's the only one I feel comfortable saying I know, but I can write Java, Kotlin, uh, JavaScript, and TypeScript, but C Sharp is the only one I'd really write, or and Java and Kotlin. Um, TypeScript and JavaScript is just when I'm trying to get around my way with React. So nothing special there, nothing fancy. What process do I follow to create a new video? Idea, script, recording software, etc. So the ideas usually come from day-to-day -day stuff that I, I'm gonna experiment with something, I'm gonna notice something interesting, I'm like, can I find the narrative behind it? And then if I do, I'm gonna make a video about it. That's why I make more, oh, here's this, idea this concept more than here's how you can do this i do have videos like this still but i don't really think they're that interesting um there is no script when i'm uh, recording the videos so i'm just spitballing but everything i show you code wise i've done before and i kind of know what's going to happen so i have a separate project in a different screen to always refer to and i'm not looking for how to do it, but just sanity checking. And then recording software, I'm using OBS to record and I am using DaVinci Resolve to edit. XMac asks, how did I manage to boost my career so early at a young age? Uh, is it personal effort, company helped me to grow? Uh, do I think it would be possible to do that in Greece? And would I consider working for a Greek company? In case you don't know by the very British accent, I am actually Greek. Um, so, Quite a few questions here. I'm going to answer the first part first. I think it's what I mentioned before and I actually had a quite a rocky start because I had the ego problem in the very beginning where I thought I'm the best person that ever touched code. Um, but I've seen it time and time again in many engineers, so it's not just me. But for me, what really helped me is saying yes to things that other people would say no because it was the tedious thing to do. Um, and I don't quite remember back in the day exactly what I would do, but I would definitely go home and do stuff and bring them at work, um, stuff we couldn't do as a day-to-day -day thing. And that definitely boosted me um, because it's that enthusiasm, it's that eagerness to do stuff. Um, but nowadays, is as a software engineer, is well, we have QA engineers, automation testers, and DevOps around us and then on the cloud. Um, and many software engineers are very uh, dogmatic on just doing software engineering and I'm not like that, I'm very open. So because QA engineers or uh, DevOps engineers are less than software engineers, their time is more valuable. So what I'm doing is I'm learning how to do those things as well and then I'm diversifying my skill set, which helps me be, well, able to do more than everybody else around me that don't do those things. So that has been a great way as well to help me boost my career. Now, that being said, being in the UK and working in London, I think it is uh, to a degree uh, a very fair meritocracy. You know, if you're good, good things will happen to you. If you're bad, not so good things will happen to you, um, which is not the case in Greece because in Greece it's more of a traditional like army type thing where the longer you are in a company the the more you deserve for some reason and that's detached to a degree to how good you are so i don't think it would be possible in greece no um and would i consider work for a greek company if they can pay me um but i don't really want to leave london i love this place and as the time goes by, I I think that Greece should stay there for holiday and my home is here now. Raid asks, do I think that uni college is important? Well, define important. Do I think that you need uni and college to actually know how to code? No, you can do that on your own. But maybe to learn how to work in a team through team projects? Yeah, you do. Maybe to get exposed to some stuff that just picking up a, a framework and doing it, uh, more lower level stuff, um, maybe yes. Um, but the truth is you don't need it to do it, but it can definitely help you if you're pitted against someone who doesn't have uni or open source projects or some coding experience to show for. So do I think that it's important? Not really. Do I think that it can help you? Yes, but it's contextual. So. If you can write perfect code out of the box and you can convince um, a recruiter to actually 
push your CV to a technical lead, review it, and then get you to do the test and pass the test, then uni was never important. But will you get to that point? Because it's very likely that the uh, recruiter will actually never send your CV to a lead to, to see it if you don't have something to show for. Kevin asks, what do I think about all the new features coming uh, with C Sharp 9 and 10? I think it's a very interesting topic and I think I'm actually gonna make a full video on that, but as you can see, since C Sharp 7, I think, um, C Sharp was going in a trajectory where they were innovating heavily and they were adding tons of features that other languages maybe didn't have or didn't have great support for. And now they're in that point where they're trying to catch up with some other stuff, like more Python stuff, um, maybe more functional features as well. And that's very interesting because they try to have a very easy learning curve. That's why you see things like the minimal API, the Feather API, whatever they call it nowadays, where with five lines of code, you can have an API and whatnot. Um, this is not for people to actually build an enterprise on, uh, but it's for people who just want to pick up C Sharp to be able to just make an API like Express would in Node very, very easily. So they're just trying to make the learning curve um, better. And I actually really like that. I'm going to talk individual features when everything solidifies, but for now, that's what I think about that. Pateo asks, um, hey Nick, I've seen all your videos. Uh, one question I have is how do you balance your personal and your professional life? This is a very interesting topic again, maybe for a separate video, but here's my opinion on the matter. I don't think you can have balance and have excellence in any of those. The reason is because time investment is rewarded with being good at something, learning more about it. And our profession by nature is something that evolves all the time. So the less time you allocate to it, the less you're gonna actually learn about it as things evolve. Now, the reason why younger people, especially engineers, are very good at progressing very fast in the beginning uh, is because they probably don't have that much of a personal life. You don't have a wife, you don't have kids probably. So you have more time to allocate to that uh, professional life. And to me, it's like a scale where you have the, the two things, one here and one here, and you have a toggle slider. Um, and depending on how much you allocate, that's how better you are at something. If you allocate all your time in your personal life, you're gonna have a great personal life and not so much of a good professional life. And, and the same for professional. But the problem is, as we grow, I think professional life demands more of a time investment for us. So things slow down in the professional life. Now, I'm in that position where I'm still allocating quite a big chunk of my time in the professional um, division, but thankfully my partner is doing so as well, and we meet in the middle. But if you don't have someone who can meet you halfway, it can be very, very hard. And to be honest, I do have a full-time job. I make these videos and they take research time and editing and all that. Someone is losing in this whole game. Um, and yeah, I don't think that there's true balance and excellence at the same time. Matteo asks, if I was to realize the desktop app, which technology would I choose? WinForm or WPF? Blazor and Electron or WebView 2 or something like that. I think the flexibility that those applications that are basically a website packaged as a desktop app uh, is unmatched. The UX you can hit with them is unmatched. And I would go with that hands down. Tim Larry asks, what is my favorite front-end framework? Uh, it is React, uh, and that includes Blazor into my consideration. Um, React is just a model I like, an approach I like. I can use TypeScript for it, so I don't care about the language that much. TypeScript is a great language. Um, so yeah, I would go with React and its ecosystem 10 times out of 10. When not coding, what do I usually do? Any hobbies? Well, I do play games um, quite a bit, but this is still very much a hobby for me. So when I'm not coding, I'm doing this. And to be honest, my free time actually involves a lot of research and trying things out and coding. Uh, I really enjoy it. I'm having tremendous fun um, when I'm doing it. So yeah. And then to finish it off, we have three questions and they're mostly around, would I make a, a series about something or maybe would I make a course in Pluralsight or Udemy? Um, there are many people who do courses and for me, the next logical step, if you were to see this as a business and a brand, 
would be to make uh, courses. However, I don't feel I have the time to actually do that. If I do that, I'm going to have to stop making videos or as good videos and just half ass them, which I don't want to do. Now, in terms of series, series require a big time investment and they're also quite uninteresting to me. So that's why I don't make them anymore. I have my REST API series, which I might revisit at some point. And if I ever make a course that is going to be for sale, it probably is going to be for that. But I don't think I will be making a series again in this channel. They don't perform well anyway. Well, these are all the questions I had time to answer in this video. But if you have any other questions, please leave a comment down below. That's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreon for making videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.